All right, I am Pastor Craig Ellison, the pastor here of Celebration Assembly. Great to be in the house of the Lord with you this morning, and it's a privilege to share with you. Um, look around the sanctuary in the church. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. Can we give a hand to all those who have helped put this beautiful stuff together? It truly is uh, the most beautiful time of the year. It really is. I love it. It, get, it just feels better in here when you, when you see everything, the different lights and everything on the inside and the outside. And so uh, thanks for being a part of it. Uh, Macbeth also wanted me to let everyone know that uh, make sure you check out the, the decorations down uh, in the fellowship hall as well that our Hispanic brothers and sisters put together. But she also wanted to say, they also made a display, a very beautiful display for those who want to have their uh, Christmas pictures taken. There's a whole area there where you can have yourself or your family and, uh, you know, grab your phone and take a picture, uh, a nice Christmas picture. There's a whole display down in the fellowship hall. So make sure you do that during this holiday season. I think that would be great. And then also, uh, the probably the most important thing I want to say, as we say every week, is that tomorrow, uh, we really pray uh, that we see you here tomorrow for the Hour of Power prayer gathering. Can I get an amen on that? Uh, that meets every single Monday here from 6.30 to 7.30. Uh, it has been growing every single week. Uh, let us come together for a true power of prayer uh, for the needs of our church, community, and nation. Prayer is so powerful and is so effective. Prayer will precede your healing. It will precede uh, your miracle. It will precede every prayer that you have prayed for. And it will precede a revival in this church. And so seriously, what happens here on Sundays, what happens in your families, everything that happens in the name of the Lord starts on a Monday night in prayer. And so it is important that you're here uh, tomorrow night. And I believe tomorrow is going to be probably the most powerful night. So you want to make sure you're here because God is here. All right. As you saw the video, we're going to be starting a new series. We'll be taking some breaks for the holidays and so forth. But we're going to be starting a, a new series called Power of the Spirit. We just finished a, a series of power prayer. Now we're going to go power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? That is power. The Holy Spirit is here to give us power to a, to a witness, power to heal, power for miracles. And I'm excited about what God is going to do. It's a new series all surrounding the topic of the person of the Holy Spirit. The one who is in each one of you who are Christ followers, and also the person, the person, I say it again, the person that we seek in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Bible makes it very clear that Paul said he wants everyone to be baptized in the Spirit. Matter of fact, he goes further and he says, do not forbid anyone to speak in tongues. And so if you're not baptized in the Spirit, today is also your day. Um, our, our scripture that we're going to be using is if you want to turn to the book of Acts, Acts 1.1. 1, 1. You'll see it on the screen. You'll see it um, uh, wherever you can. Let's get right into it. Acts 1.1. 1, 1. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving the instruction through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, after his suffering... He presented himself to them and gave them and gave, gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and he spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave this command. Jesus said, do not leave Jerusalem. Do not leave your hometown. But wait for the gift of my, pro my father promised which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water. Water baptism. But in a few days you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Baptized in the Holy Spirit. With the physical, with the first physical evidence, which is speaking in tongues. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But 
you will receive power. Everyone say power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, at home, and in all of Judea, Wisconsin, and Samaria, and the country, and in all the ends of the earth. And after he said this, Jesus was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. Jesus gave them this command, do not leave home. Do not leave Jerusalem. They needed to wait. No time frame was given, but they were called to wait. Apparently, this is really important. They need to receive the gift that the Father had promised. Before they could do anything that God really wanted them to do, they needed to wait for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And if God found it so important for the early church to be baptized, how much more do we in modern day need to be baptized in the Spirit? They are not to leave the city. They are not to leave home until they have it. Don't leave home without it. Sounds like a commercial, doesn't it? Charles Spurgeon said this, Without the Spirit of God, we can do nothing. We are as ships without the wind. We are useless. Without the Holy Spirit, you can say how much you are a Christian. That you are a useless one without the Holy Spirit. Amen? My first thing, my first thought is this is not a ritual. It's not a formula. This is the real deal. You can't put the Holy Spirit in a ritual. You can't put the Holy Spirit in a formula. It won't work. It was never intended to work that way. It is clear from Jesus' words that they will not be effective without this essential, without this that is essential. You cannot 100% be effective if you are not operating in the power and the authority of the Holy Spirit. Amen? For John baptized with water. John baptized with water. The, Holy, uh, the baptism of water. Believer's baptism. That is a ritual. That is a ritual when you think about it. That can be more of a, of a ritual. The water baptism, you can think of more as a ritual. You come to know the Lord, then you get baptized. It's almost that, that rite of passage. That can be sometimes looked at as ritual. It's a sign of your commitment of life. You come to know the Lord, then you get water baptized. It's a sign of your commitment of a righteous life. But it cannot change you. But the Holy Spirit can. But in a few days, the Bible says you will be baptized, but not just with water, not in a ritual, no, but with power of the Holy Spirit. It's power, power in our lives. That's the real deal. It's the real McCoy. It's the real thing. That is the power for a new life. It's not a ritual. Or it's not even a symbolic event that sometimes water baptism can be looked at. No, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the real deal. We are confronted, now listen to me, and this is your space. We are confronted not with an it of the Holy Spirit. You are literally confronted with the person of the Holy Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit is, is a real person. Just as real as the Father is, just as real as the Son is, the Holy Spirit is a person. Why do I know that? Because the Holy Spirit is God. The Father is God. The Son is God. The Holy Spirit is God. They are all three, but they're all God. God in three persons, blessed Trinity. My voice wasn't so rough, I'd maybe sing a little better, but you understand, the Holy Spirit is a person. When the Holy Spirit came down, the disciples will transform. They weren't just tickled. They just didn't say, wow, that was a great goosebump experience. They were transformed. Early in the Lord, earlier the Lord said this in John 14, and I will ask the Father, I will ask my Father, and he will give you another advocate. He will give you a comforter. Isn't that interesting? I just noticed that. 
And I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate. He didn't just say, I will give you the advocate. What God would think is, I, again, I'm just seeing this real time with you right now. I net, you know what? Wow. I'm just seeing this right now. I think what Jesus is saying there is, I'm going to send you another me. I'm going to send you God. I'm not going to just, because if he just said, I'm going to send you an advocate, it almost could be like, I'm sending you something else. You know, I, there's the father. You know, there's the Father, hi, I'm the Son, and then I'm sending you a Holy Spirit. We're all three separate things. No, but he said, it's almost like I'm sending you another of me. I'm sending you another advocate. It's not like, it's not like oh, there's Holy Spirit 1.0, I'm sending you Holy Spirit 2.0. No, he's sending you, I'm sending you another. Like, I'm sending you myself but here's what Jesus is saying. It, when I'm here, I, if I'm here, this is where Jesus is. If I'm here, this is where Jesus is. But, if I, but I have to go so that I can send another, another of me, but this time I'll be everywhere. I'm going to be in your heart. I'm going to be in your home. I'm going to be in your school. I'm going to be in your church. I'm going to be everywhere where you are and you know what I'll be everywhere where you're not so I need to go so I can send another advocate another me the same God but everywhere can I get an amen that should give you peace and that should give you comfort that God isn't just sending like you know what we have the father we have the son I'm gonna send you know the the little the little advocate no I'm sending you another advocate I'm sending you again myself the Holy Spirit that will be everywhere not only that what advocate means is comforter do you need comfort? Do you need peace? That is what the Holy Spirit is. His primary thing is your comforter. He wants to help you and to be with you forever and ever and ever as the spirit of truth. The word cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he lives with you. The Holy Spirit lives with you and in you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I'm not going to leave you crying. I'm not going to leave you in pain. I'm not going to leave you struggling as orphans. I will literally come to you. Matter of fact, you can put that name in there. I will come to Craig. I will come to Joe Bath. I will come to Brack. I will come to Deborah. I will come to you. No longer do you need to come to me because I can only go in so many places. That's what Jesus would say, come to me. But when the Holy Spirit says is here, the Holy Spirit comes to you. Amen. Amen. The word cannot see him or know him, but we do. For he lives with you and in you. Only believers will be able to experience him. And it is through him that we see Christ. We hear Christ and we experience Christ. The Lord said again, I will not leave you. I will not leave you, Margaret. I will not leave you, Marcia. I will not leave you, Juanita, I will not leave you as orphans, church. I will come to you. I'm much better than Amazon. I will come immediately, right to you. Not that I'm a little bitter that our packages haven't shown up for a couple of weeks, but it's another story. The Holy Spirit is here. Amen. How is that happening? Through the Holy Spirit who dwells in you with us, Emmanuel. Amen. It is by means of the Spirit that Jesus' life is made available to you. Did you hear me? It is by means of the Holy Spirit that Jesus' life is made available to you. It doesn't say that the Spirit and Jesus are different. It's the same. They're both God. The Spirit that Jesus' life is made available to you through the Holy Spirit. The human body is the most remarkable machine ever created. It can maintain a constant temperature of 98.6 degrees, no matter what the weather is outside. 
whether a person is in the, think of this, whether you're in the Arctic Circle or the equator, your body temperature is going to be about the same. That's incredible when you think about it. There is an inner mechanism in each body that makes the difference. For the Christian, the Holy Spirit is that inner mechanism as well. When, the, when you are in, when you go into a place that's cold spiritually, he comforts you and gives you warmth. When, you're circum, when you go into a circumstance that's fearful and that's hot and that's dark as intense, he will then cool you down and give you peace. No matter what circumstance you're in, a cold circumstance or a hot circumstance, your temperature of the Lord is always the same. He will always be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. He did it to his son, but he will never do it to you. My next point is that it's not about a program, but it's about a power. Acts 1.8, but you will receive power, say power. When the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and everywhere in the world. It is not about a program, but a power that is at work in you. These followers said to him, Lord, Jesus, are you going to at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? They were thinking in terms of timetables, schedules and programs. What are you going to do? When is this all going to happen? How is it all going to happen? Jesus said, this is not for you to know. The timing and the schedule and the program, these are not for you to know. That's all in the Father's authority. Your task, church, is to be a manifestation or display of the power of the Spirit. Not the knowledge of a program. The Father will take care of that. You just need to exercise the power of the Holy Spirit that is in you. And the Father will put it all together and work it all together at the right time. You don't need to be concerned about the timetable and the strategy and the methodology of God's work. The times and the seasons are in the hands of God. And it is always, and in many times, it's not for us to know. But Jesus said, though I am not going to let you know the program, I will give you the power. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. If you're not experiencing the power, you might have to check if you have the Spirit. Because when you are baptized in the Spirit, you have power. What kind of power? It is the power to witness. It is the power to proclaim the gospel, as your next space there shows. The Holy Spirit gives you the power to live lives changed. The Holy Spirit gives you power to comfort. The Holy Spirit gives you power to heal. The Holy Spirit gives you power to rebuke, to rebuke the power of the devil himself. When we think of power, we often think of things that make loud noises or explosions or pounding or hammering or something like that. But when the power of the Spirit is working, it can absolutely be quiet as your next space is and unseen. Although quiet, it is irresistible. Even though you might not hear it, it is more, it is peaceful and irresistible. Even the devil cannot resist it. When he, the Holy Spirit, touches the heart of a repentant sinner, there is no way to oppose it, no way to overthrow it, no way to stop it. Every obstacle thrown in the path of the Holy Spirit will be turned into an opportunity to advance the will of the Father. We see that in the Gospels and Acts and in the early and in church history, we see that today in the lives of many, many people we know, the Holy Spirit changes lives from within and not from outside. It does not start on the outside with the environment or the circumstances or the external situation. It starts within, within the four walls of an upper room and then works out, changing the world, ultimately. We need him. We need the Holy Spirit. It is about the Holy Spirit's power, not about a ritual or a program. Amen? Amen. 
And my last thing that I have for you today is that it's not about propaganda. It's not about propaganda, but it's about witnessing. It's uh, slide 17, son. It's not about a propaganda, but it's about witnessing. What is propaganda? I think we all of us really know this. We see it a lot in the news and in politics. It's information, especially of a biased or a misleading nature, used to promote or publicize a particular cause or point of view. Oh, I'm sorry, we don't see that in politics. I don't know what I was talking about there. And then Jesus says the world will be changed, not by propaganda, but by witnessing. You will be my witnesses, he said. Christians are not like salesmen. We are not like salesmen going out to sell a product. Or are we, or we're not recruiters going around trying to get people to join your club. No, that's wrong. When a church becomes more like a club, mm, this one's a good one. When a church becomes more like a club or a special, or a special group only or a, or a good boys club, it loses all of its power. We are called to witness. William Seymour, William Seymour said this. He was an African-American preacher. I know him quite well as a pastor. I mean quite well as, and I studied him. I'm not that old where I actually met him, all right? But he's an African-American preacher who initiated the most, the biggest, one of the biggest revivals known in modern day of the Azusa Street Revival. He's an influential uh, it was an influential event in the rise of Pentecostalism, of the Pentecostal movement. And out of that movement, guess what came out of that movement? Us. So uh, William Seymour was instrumental in this revival. This revival brought the rise of the Pentecostal movement. And we, the Assemblies of God, was birthed. So I studied a lot about this awesome, incredible man of God. And I have books on him. And he stated this. I can say through the power of the Holy Spirit that wherever God can get a people, where he can get a church that will come together in one accord and one mind in the word of God, the baptism of the Holy Spirit will fall upon that people like in Cornelius' home. I think that's awesome. Let us be a church that comes together prays together, and seeks God like never before. Amen. The mark of a false church is that it loves to talk about itself and to be an island to the rest of the community. They are fully satisfied of the group and the size they are. The early Christians in church and acts never witnessed about themselves. They witnessed for Christ. Peter preached all about Christ and power. Peter talked about Jesus, or Paul talked about Jesus. A church that is preoccupied. Now listen to this. This is so good. You're going to underscore this. Here's your next space. A church that is preoccupied with Christ is a sign of revival. A church that all that it talks about, all that it thinks about, all that it does is all about Christ. You know revival's on the way. Did you hear that? I want Celebration Assembly to be so preoccupied with the power of the Holy Spirit that revival is commonplace. Amen. <laughs> the promise of the Father is not restricted in any way. It will begin in Jerusalem, right here in Fond du Lac, and then in Wisconsin, and will go to the outer parts of the world. It is prophetic. The Lord says, you will be my witnesses to all the ends of the earth. God sees the end from the beginning. He said that at a time when there were no cars and there were no planes. And 2,000 years later, we are closer to the goal of the end of the world than we've ever been before. Look at the news. Look at the signs of the times. It is all over that the time of the Lord is closer than ever before. Look in the Middle East. 
Look in the Middle East where the world is all against the little sliver of land called Israel. The only sliver that God created. The only country that God created of Israel is the one area that the world wants to destroy. That to me shows that the end is coming. We must pray up. We must be prepared. We must tell our kids and grandkids and do whatever it takes to tell them the Lord is coming. Repent, 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 repent. For the Lord is here. And the only way you're going to go to heaven is not by your good works, not because mom and dad are going to heaven, but it's because you come on your hands and knees and say, God, forgive me for, forgive me for everything that I've done. Come into my heart. Resurrect my body. Have your way in my life. Take it all, Lord. Take it all. Take it all. Luke 11 says that if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit to those who ask? to those who ask. If I have any elders here that can come forward, I want all of us to stand with our heads down. God is in this room. The Holy Spirit is speaking. The person of the Holy Spirit is speaking in your heart now. Where do you need to be healed today? James 5 says this, if anyone, is, uh, if anyone here is sick, if any one of you don't feel well, if any of you are not right, then let them call on the elders that we have here to pray over you and anoint you in the name of the Lord Jesus. And the prayer and that our elders will pray by faith will make you well. And the Lord will raise you up. If you're in this room and if you have sinned, they will be forgiven. I'm stopping right there. I got to stop. <coughs> Pastor Craig, I wish, I wish, <coughs> I wish there was another place where I really knew that Christ died for my healing and my sins. Guys, here, because it says if you're sick, come up front, you will be healed. If you sin, you will be healed. God literally makes those two together, not because it's coincidence, because again, he is saying, my blood not only forgave you of your sins, but my blood covers cancer, Alzheimer's disease, anything you're struggling with. I died for both. That's why James has both of them in there, because his blood is enough. If you're looking, if you don't, if you're one of those and like, well, no, I know he forgave, I know he, he, I know he forgave my sin. I just didn't know if he really is there to heal me. He again says, I did both come and get prayed for. You will be healed. I'm not making it up. I'm not naming and claiming it. This is a promise that the Lord said. First John five says that this is the confidence that we have. That if we ask anything according to the Lord, he will answer, he will hear you. And if we know that he hears us, that whatever you ask for today, that you will have what you ask for in the name of Jesus. And so I'm going to pray. And after I pray, after I pray, we're going to go into one last worship song. And we're going to make this sanctuary a place of prayer. This is a house of prayer. This is a house of healing. If you want to talk about your food, if you want to talk about all the good stuff, please do it in the foyer. The sanctuary is a house of prayer. And as soon as I'm done praying, we're going to go in the one last worship song. And if you need to come to the altar, we believe the altar is, is set a fire of the Holy Spirit that wants to meet you and wants to burn away every sin that you have, but it also wants to consume you and, and fill you with the Holy Spirit. If you want prayer for anything, from a cough to cancer, or want to come back to the Lord, the elders will pray for you. But here, if you are here today and you desire more than salvation, if you desire more than the water baptism, and you're here and you want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit with speaking in tongues and with fire, I will also be here and I want to pray over you for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so when I pray and after I pray, 
We're going to sing one last worship song, but, the, but the, the altars are open. Let God do what only he can do, and let's spend time with God. Dear Lord and Father, I thank you for this church. I love this church. There is a revival fire coming. There is a spirit baptism coming. This church is going to do things like never before. And I see right now that Satan is so scared of what this church can do that he doesn't want it to happen. Satan's going to stop it, but the whole Holy Spirit is going to go, 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 go. And we love you. And we're going in power. And we're going in truth. And we're going in life. In your holy name, we say, amen, amen, amen. Let's worship and pray. Amen.